everybody, Ghost Girl 007 here. In today's video, well, Ghost Girl, Angel Ghost Girl. It's not Ghost Girl 007 anymore, it's Angel Ghost Girl. Put it like that, put it like that, put it right there. Ignore that. But, um, this is going to be episode 33. Something a little funny in so this, funny. Yeah, look, what page it is. What chapter? Chapter 33, everybody. And this is page 237. And this chapter is called Southwest Hell. Wrong place at the wrong time. I hate flying for many reasons, but mostly because it's one it's one very weird thing to me. Every time I fly, I have to pee a lot. Someone can just say the word water and I'm sprinting to the lavatory in mid-flight. I'm sure there's some sort of medical name for it, like depressurized bladder syndrome, but the last thing I want to do is see a doctor about it. That's a waste of health care dollars. I just suck it up and sit in the aisles seat so I can get there faster. When I fly, which I do a lot, I usually have to pee six to eight times during a two hour flight. And when I do get up and go to the lavatory, I can, can't pee, even though I have to. So I stand there listening to the flight attendants do their thing just outside the lavatory with nothing happening for me down below, then I start imagining that there is no wall and I'm standing there with 200 people staring at me. And then I get scared that one of the doors will break open and I'll get sucked out of the lavatory with my wiener hanging out. <laughs> or maybe the section of the toilet will pull me out of the plane. It's like a whole new bag of crazy stage fright or society anxiety, social anxiety disorder. I hate it. For those of you that don't know, we're reading right now, I Am Haunted, Living the Life of the Dead by Zach Beggins. Should have said that already, but it's all right. Social anxiety disorder, I hate it. When I get back to my seat, Eight times out of ten, I hit my head on the overhead compartment, and it's like Keystone Cops Theater with the whole plane full of passengers watching me. It's impossible to play it off when 200 bored people see you ram your forehead into a piece of plastic with a loud thump and laugh at your pain. So the bottom line is, I hate flying, especially when something goes wronger than wrong. I was coming home to Vegas on Southwest Airlines after filming an episode. I was in the front row of the plane in the aisle seat so I could get to the lavatory quickly each and every time I took a drink of anything. It was just any, another flight except for one thing. The flight attendant was gorgeous. I mean, Danica Patrick hot. And on the top of that, she was super nice to everyone. Like, genuinely nice. And not in, and I'm being nice to you because I have to, have to, but kind of a way. I don't make up snap judgments, and I sure wasn't on a love quest, but I definitely had a little high altitude crush going on. We were getting ready to land, and once again, I had to go to the bathroom. We were descending rapidly, so I knew that if I didn't go right away, I'd be holding it for a long, painful spell. You know the deal. After landing, the plane has to taxi, and then we all wait until they bring out their jetway and open the doors. And by the time I get to a bathroom inside the airport, I'm probably standing in a pool of my own urine. No way that was going to happen, especially not in front of this perfect 10. I was going to go even if I had to barrel through a platoon of air 
marshals to get there. You're not supposed to get up after the stay in your seat under penalty of death light goes on. But I wasn't having it. But if I had known then what I know now, I would have stayed put. I got up, went to the laboratory, locked the door, and lifted up the toilet seat. And there was Mr. Stanky, a big nasty log of crap, was clinging to the side of the toilet. Don't think we really need to know this, but okay. I got, I got a nose full of it, and oh dear God, I was nearly sick to my stomach and had absolutely no desire to pee anymore. I didn't care. I didn't dare touch the fl the flush button because I assumed that whoever had the gal to lay down this red wood log of doom and not make sure that it got flush probably didn't wash his hands either. I had one driving mission at that point to get out fast. I turned and bolted with the toilet seat still up and the log still maintaining its death clutch to the side of the bowl. I should have tried to get rid of it so it, the next person wouldn't have to see it, but I was too grossed out. It was so, it was self preservation, but I, but as I came out of the lavatory, I looked down in the aisle and saw the super hot flight attendant walking towards me from the rear of the airplane. At first I didn't care, but as I clicked my seat belt in, it hit me. She was heading towards the lavatory. A million things flashed through my mind. None of them good. This was a really bad situation. She was going to come up there and check out the lavatory and think I said laid down that log. <laughs> She didn't see how long I was in there. She didn't know that I had walked in and walked right out again. She was going to think that I went in there and took a giant crap and didn't flush. Panic set in. I grabbed the media control controller handle on my arm set on my armrest and thought of all those silly video games com combinations to unlock a secret move. Maybe left up, left down, spin, spin, kick, kick would eject me from the social hell I was in, which only got deeper with each step she took. The seconds ticked away like an eternity as she slowly made her way to the front of the plane. I was in the front row and had no seat to hide behind as she reached the front and started doing flight attendant things. I started sweating. I was moments away from a full-fledged panic attack. She put the trash in a bag and turned all the red switches on the control panels and did all the stuff they do to prepare for landing. Maybe I'd get lucky. Maybe she wouldn't, but then she did. She opened the door to the lavatory and my worst fears came true. She looked in the toilet and saw what I saw. Mr. Stanky staring back at her, meaner and smellier than ever. She turned to me with the most disgusted look on her face and I knew that any chance I had to meet her was flush. Aw, poor thing. Pun intended, to add insult to injury, she balanced on one leg, lifted the other to flush button like a perk to, not even say that, doesn't even seem English, performer, a circus, let's just put it like a circus performer, and hit it with her toes while her gorgeous face frowned the frown of eternal dimension. At that point, I didn't care if the plane crashed like a lawn dart. I have never taken and will never take a dump on an airplane. I can barely pee in the many hundreds of flights I've taken in my life. I've never once felt the urge to go number two, 
no matter how long the flight was. I'm fine with people who do it, but for for sakes, flush not flushing is like blowing your nose in your hand and then shaking my hand. It's just not right. I took the blame for that log and it wasn't even mine. I wanted to stand up and tell the flight attendant that it was the guy two rows back whom I'd seen go in there a minute before I did. As if this nightmare couldn't drag on any longer, it did. She kept flushing, but the demon poo refused to go down, like it was attached to the bowl with some sort of crazy monkey glue compound. With every flush, I descended to another level of hell, and not the kind I am used to. To this day, it still bugs me a little, because she probably tells her friends about the disgusting guy from Ghost Adventures who didn't flush and the, they all laugh about it while watching my show. We all have embarrassments like this that we want to get forget. It was a horrible moment of being in the wrong place at the wrong time that will stick with me forever. I hate flying. So now we're going to move on and we're going to go to, we're going to read page 34, chapter 200, well, actually this is chapter three, 34 and page 241. And this was called The Devil. Just leave him alone. Good advice there. The paranormal, the paranormal field has more questions than answers. And working in it day after day can be maddening. So many times I feel like I'm on the edge of a discovery, but end up right back where I started. Religion is especially tricky. My years of poking and prodding, the very basis of our existence, have convinced me that God and Jesus do exist. But when you believe that, you have to acknowledge that the other side must exist too. It's not easy to admit that the devil is real. I've been there and I can tell you that he's as bad as people say he is. So many people pray every day. Prayer is a ritual that involves certain movements and postures. Bowing the head, making the sign of the cross, holding hands together in humility. It's one ritual of many in the church. There are rituals for taking the holy sacrament, rituals for confessing sins, rituals for joining together in holy matrimony, and many others depending depending on your denomination houses of worship wherever wherever welcome millions upon millions of people who feel that they have a relationship with God and ask for forgiveness of their sins so where does it, sin come from is it human nature or does the devil try to influence the world by making people sin and why do some people commit more extreme sins than others abuse corruption violence murder these are all ways uh, ways i believe the devil feeds the spiritual battle between god and the devil is always at work every day every minute every second when a possession occurs, we see this struggle firsthand. We see supernatural things happen. The possess possessed person levitating and speaking in tongues, holy water, scarring the skin, evil being cast out by good, it's powerful. So what happens to those who seek God? If they worship God wholeheartedly and lead whole, holier lives than others does god give them the gift of tranquility and erase all violence from them does god make them pure and do they live more peaceful lives i bet many of them do do i have a deep connection with god in christ i would say i do but at times i question it i ask the same questions that athletes and 
gonna acknowledge this always ask why god or jesus would allow so much pain and to happen in life especially to innocent children my faith isn't shaken but i continually ask why these awful things are allowed to go on if god created life then why doesn't he maintain it why doesn't he show us his godly power and correct the things that are happening in the life he gives us it's not anti-religious or wrong to question god I pray sometimes, I wonder whether anyone hears it, but I believe that there is a cleansing power in prayer. It reminds your body that there is something beyond its confines. You can train yourself through prayer, just like everyone wants me to show them a ghost or spirit. People want to hear and feel God to believe in him. So they pray and hope that those prayers are answered. Funny thing, I question God and Jesus, but I don't question ex exorcists. I've seen so many exorcisms, they're powerful. They invoke the name of God to indicate a demon from a living body. I have had a demon inside me and felt the stinging and burning when holy water was sprinkled on my forehead in that moment i felt god and lightly i've been thinking more and more about how evil spirits and entities can try to make you sick and even kill you the though to be fair good spirits can also do you harm if they try to use your energy or channel through you and what about the people who try to pursue the devil not necessarily to worship the devil, but to explore it. Demonologists are usually very religious individuals who only seek to understand the devil. Why wouldn't they? It's only natural to want to know, find the answers to our questions about religion and explore what lies beyond God and Jesus. To do that, we have to go where the action is and where that, where's that? On a battlefield and where is the battlefield between God and the devil exorcisms exorcisms are ground zero for the struggle between good and evil both sides fight fiercely to control an innocent human being a pure soul who has no desire to part of the battle it's usually a soul with a lot of potential that the devil wants to control and the angels want to leave alone to live a peaceful and productive life the body becomes the battlefield but there are other battlefields too real ones made of earth and stone that humans whether they mean to or not sometimes mess with opening up a portal that should have been left mis disturbed when we went to Ireland to film Ghost Adventures, we decided to research and try to inter some of the ancient legends and to attempt to find the devil himself. Ireland is such an intriguing place. So many mysterious things have happened on these ancient lands and still do. There were the Druids, an ancient Celtic people who religious leaders seemed to understand the struggle between good and evil and got themselves mixed up in it to this day historians don't understand much about the druids and the rituals they performed but some accounts say that those rituals involved human sacrifice when christianity came to emerald island and Isle everyone turned their attention to jesus it's said that the mythological creatures gods and goddesses buried themselves in the ground where they still lie dormant waiting for the right time to reappear to travel to lands that are home to ancient burial grounds and stone passageways and gave corns an amazing these kinds of places are found all over the 
island and there's so much that's unknown about these ancient peoples and their religions practices it's like layer upon layer of questions with no answers two of these sites the how fire club atop montepillar hill in county dublin and loftus hall to the south are said to have been visited by the devil himself these stories have been passed down for centuries so they seem like the right places for us to begin our investigations but then the crap hits the fan we try to summon satan we try to call him out i hate to admit it but we thought we could pull it off and i witnessed one of the most disturbing things i've ever seen since i started doing this job it may have permanently affected one of my best friends the ghost adventures crew doesn't live by a code book for paranormal investigating some other paranormal groups think that you have to live by a set of rules and everybody has to investigate this way or that way people preach that there's one right way to investigate that's like some backwater group telling a priest how to pray it just doesn't make sense and they look stupid when they try to force their investigation methods on others now i won't be a hypocrite and suggest that we don't have our own process and standards that we share with the ghost adventures affiliated crews we've been doing this a long time and we've developed many effective techniques for conducting paranormal research but there's are groups who are so set in their ways that they aren't flexible enough to adapt to different situations and end up missing out on great opportunities every haunted location is different what works in one place may not work in another spirits are people without physical bodies and every person living or dead is an individual bruce lee was the true father of mixed martial arts and he taught his students this don't let yourself be so rigid and flexible that you can't adapt to your opponent when it comes time to fight be like water and flow let the environment dictate how you dictate how you move not the other way around the same can be said for paranormal investigation every place and every ghost is unique and you have to be able to adapt in the end the results are more important that the process evidence and progress are what count the most now there are groups out there that take this job to extreme levels vandalizing property and mutilating themselves and other ridiculous crap and i agree that they're not doing it right but the ghost adventures crew tries to hard to let investigators be investigators and move the field forward we like to expand ourselves by participating in rituals and having emotional experiences just as people go to church and pray to better themselves just as we seek to celebrate to collaborate our themselves to have an experience with god we so celebrate ourselves to connect to the spirits but we may have taken it too far in ireland we were on top of Mont Montpillar Hill at the Hellfire Club. At the top of this hill, there's a beautiful old hunting lodge that was built around 1725 by a wealthy man who used stones from a nearby passage grave. The store, story goes that he had no idea what he'd done. Not only were the stones taken from a burial ground but the woods surrounding the lodge were said to be filled with an ancient demons and creatures had that had buried themselves there when when christianity came it's said that the devil himself visited the lodge 
and blew off the roof just after it was completed. Years later, the secretive satanic hellfire club held its rituals there to call upon the devil. It is said that Satan appeared in the lodge during a card game and among the members in the cl clothed feet in fireballs. It sounds kind of crazy, but it's right up my alley. So we investigated this lodge and went through the ritual to sum summon Satan when something unexpected and terrifying happened. We got an answer. First we captured rocks and glass moving in the sounds of a claw scratching across something, probably the ground. Then something happened to Aaron. He claimed he felt a claw hand firmly grab his ear and pull it backwards with force, along with a powerful jolt of dark energy, and he believes to this day that Satan touched his ear. Later I asked the spirits who touched Aaron, and a woman's voice said, Satan. It was the only voice we got that night, and we knew immediately that we'd pushed it too far. I saw my friend in a state of absolute panic, which I had never seen before. He started crying, and for once in my life, I had no idea what to do. I was truly disturbed to see my friend in such agony, because I knew that something very powerful was present in the Hellflower Club, and lashed out at him. I was very concerned for Aaron because earlier in that day he felt compelled to remove a stone from the satanic circle in the lodge and left it, left with it. I think he cursed himself when he did that, but it goes further than that. A couple of years earlier we were at the Hellfire Caves in England which are connected to the Hellfire Lodge in Ireland where a witch doused Aaron in ghost's blood during a pagan ritual. He wasn't the same after the ceremony. I think he was toying with things that he wasn't prepared to deal with. His experience at the lodge was a combination of both events, not a singular event. He's a strong person, but one is equipped to deal with the devil and his demons. I've looked through his eyes and he's looked through mine. So this is a picture, I guess, of kind of just give you an idea. Pretty creepy, right? A few nights later, we did our investigation at Loctis Hall, and Aaron still wasn't himself. I thought it was too soon for him to continue investigating, but he is too much of a professional not to go on. We had to let him participate for the sake of the show, but for me, it was like being a corner man and telling your fighter that you can fight any you can't fight anymore, despite his broken hands and nose. His drive one allowed the injuries to hold him back, but you know that he just is in for more pain if he continues. At Loftus Hall, I was using the structure light sensor camera and a spirit appeared on Aaron's head where he was calling out to the devil. The spirit even did things on command while Aaron was in the near catalytic state and I was torn because it was an incredible paranormal moment, but it was also forcing my friend even deeper into the darkness. As I was writing this chapter, We've been back from Ireland for only a few weeks, and Aaron's still not himself. He isn't losing his mind, but he's been quiet and secretive, and I don't know what's going on with him. We went to Ireland to find answers and debunk myths, but we came back freaked out like never before. I can't say for certain that we found the devil himself, but as a scientist in the studies of paranormal, I observed a key element that I can't explain. I have no answer except to say that it's a little terrifying. Even if I was an utter skeptic, what I felt and saw is crazy, and I'm worried for Aaron. Maybe he'll be fine by the time this book comes out, or maybe it will get worse. I don't know. I'm definitely concerned to see what happens to him, what happens to him to make me question why I do this a little bit. Some people have experience with God 
and want them to last forever. And some unfortunate souls have experiences with Satan and don't want to remember them. And that is it for the day. If you like this kind of video, like and subscribe and comment in the comments below. And until next time, everybody stay creepy and I'll see you next time.